Good morning and welcome to Powell Presbyterian Church. It is a joy and a delight as always to be church with you this morning. Although we are separated by distance, we know that we are united by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us worship God. Look to the Lord your God and live. Give thanks to the Holy One, our Savior. For though we were once dead in sin, now by the grace of God we live. Let us worship God. Friends, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, our God, who is merciful and just, will forgive all our transgressions. So let us approach God with a prayer of confession. Let us pray. God, our Redeemer, we confess that we are people of ashes and dust. We grumble and complain when you have provided all we need. We continue to walk in darkness when you have given light to the world. Forgive us, God of grace. Help us to trust in you so that we may not perish, but may have eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, the good news of the gospel is this. While we were still sinners, our Lord Jesus Christ died for us. Through the power of Jesus Christ and made known to us in the waters of baptism that reconcile us to God and to one another, we are forgiven. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. I'll read from the New Revised Standard Version. Hear the word of God. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Our gospel reading comes from John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Very familiar words to you, I'll bet also from the New Revised Standard Version. Hear the good news. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, many of you know that I have four sons. And they were not well-spaced out sons. These sons are very close together. And so there was a time in my life when I had four little boys. Not so many years ago, Valentine's Day rolled around. Now, when you have four little boys, Valentine's Day is much less about a romantic holiday with your beloved and much more about little paper valentines that you have to write your name on a hundred times and making boxes to contain all of those and buying enough candy hearts for everyone. 
And so I hadn't really prepared with, for Valentine's Day with much anticipation anyway. But on this particular Valentine's Day, I was sick. Very, very sick. And I don't get sick. If you know me very well, I get the sniffles periodically, but I really don't get sick. I just don't have time for it. But on this particular Valentine's Day, I was sick. I was sick enough that I finally said to Mike, I think I need to go to the doctor. Now, I mean, I practically have to have an arm falling off of my body before I'm willing to go to a doctor for it. So you know I was not well. And on this particular Valentine's Day, I made an appointment and I went into one of those walk-in after hours clinics uh, in a Walgreens or something like that. And they thought I might have strep throat based on the symptoms that I gave them, but they gave me a swab and said, no, they didn't think it was strep throat. The rapid test was negative anyway, and they couldn't really find anything wrong. She said, you probably have a virus. My suggestion to you is that you go home and rest. And I think I probably laughed right in that poor woman's face right then because I wanted to point out to her that I had come to the doctor with four little kids in tow I don't get rest. But when I told Mike about it, he said he was on his way home. And he came home and he took all of those four little boys and he left the house with them. I don't exactly know where they went because I went to sleep. I fell asleep and I slept hard and I slept long and I also don't nap. This is not, a, it's not a skill that I have napping during the day but I was so sick, I just needed to rest. And I fell asleep and I napped and I fell hard into deep sleep. When I woke up, all four of my boys had been fed dinner. The dishwasher was unloaded and reloaded with the dirty dishes from dinner. They were all freshly bathed and in crisp pajamas, ready to be put to their early bedtime. Now I know that you could probably tell stories of really romantic Valentine's days that involved massive proposals and roses and flowers and chocolates and jewelry and candlelit dinners. But I can tell you that I have never felt a more romantic Valentine's day than the Valentine's day where I was given the opportunity to rest where someone took the responsibilities off of my plate for a while and my husband said, I'll take care of those things, you take care of you. I think that that's probably the closest that human beings can ever get to what we call unconditional love. We can't really understand what unconditional love is because we are human beings. I love my husband very much and he does wonderful things like that for me and I love my children with everything that I am and would do absolutely anything to keep them safe and healthy and happy. And I would call that unconditional love. And I hope that you have someone that you love in this way, a child or a parent or a spouse or a friend, someone that you feel like you would give everything for and that feeling is mutual. But let's face it, even the most perfect kind of human love is still human love. We can't ever fully love unconditionally because there's always that bit of us that is human that harbors resentment and greed and anger over deeds that have long since passed. That's just part of being human. But that's not the only kind of love. God's love is truly unconditional. God's love is unspeakable and unimaginable and unstoppable and truly unconditional. God's love is demonstrated throughout the entirety of the Bible. In fact, if I, I think if you asked me to condense the Bible into just a few words, I would say God is love. First John tells us that twice, God is love. And to truly know and truly understand God, one must first realize that love constitutes God's very nature. Love is God's defining attribute. Just like heat cannot be separated from fire and wetness cannot be separated from water, so too God cannot be separated from love. 
God loves because God is love. For God so loved the world. I suspect that if you grew up in a Christian setting, you were probably encouraged to memorize the words of John 3.16 at some point in your life. I learned them in the King James Version with the whosoever believeth in him language. And as I say it, I can almost smell the musty classroom of my childhood Sunday school days as I recite the words in my head. My Sunday school teacher, and perhaps yours too, decided that those words carried enough weight in our theology that they were important early lessons in our Christian foundation. They were worth committing to memory. And I think my Sunday school teacher was right about those because they are foundational. God loves me and God loves you. God loves you so much that God put on human flesh and entered into this brutal world and lived and died for you. God's love and sacrifice through Jesus Christ is so powerful that we are restored into God's holy presence, not because you and I have earned it, but because God just loves us that much. Love and forgiveness and reconciliation are given freely with love because although we aren't so good at it, God has unconditional love mastered. Although we know the words of John 3.16 well, we don't often think about what the setting of those words are. Jesus speaks these powerful words to Nicodemus. Nicodemus has been asking some really tough questions. Jesus has told him that no one can see God's kingdom without being born again. And Nicodemus responds back with his famously naive question, how can I be born when I am old? I can't re-enter my mother's womb. And Jesus patiently tries to explain by saying, people give birth to people. Spirit gives birth to spirit. But Nicodemus still doesn't get it. Like so many others, Nicodemus has confused the things of God with the things of the flesh. He thought that Jesus was referring to a physical birth, a returning to his mother's womb, an absolute impossibility. Even with his vast knowledge of the Old Testament, Nicodemus was still spiritually very lost, confused. Even with all of his money and his power and his knowledge, he still doesn't get the one thing that would really change his life forever. God loves him. God loves him powerfully and fully and beyond anything that he can comprehend. God loves him so much that Jesus Christ is literally standing face to face with him to demonstrate that love for all humanity for all time. There were no exceptions for Nicodemus. Despite anything in his life that he had done or left undone, there were no exceptions for the tax collectors or the Pharisees or the criminals hanging on the cross or even the ones who executed Jesus for their own political gain. There were no exceptions in Jesus's time and there are no exceptions even today. God loves you. God loves you exactly how you are, where you are, for who you are, despite anything that you have done and despite anything that you may have left undone. Regardless of what anyone may have told you to the contrary, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that you can do to separate yourself from the love of God through Christ Jesus. You are unconditionally, wildly, perfectly loved by the one who made you, and there is nothing that you can do to take away from that or to add to that. So beloved, go be loved. Go radiate that love so that everyone who looks at you says that you glow. Go bask in that love so that it washes over you and fills in your deepest, hollowest, dark places of the soul. Go spread that love so that everyone who crosses your path will know that they are loved too. Because you, beloved, are loved beyond all comprehension. Yes, you. Thanks be to God. Let us turn to the God who loves us unconditionally with our prayers for ourselves and our loved ones and our community and the world. Let us pray. 
Up out of the ashes, up from the dust, we bring to you our prayers, O God. In your steadfast love, O Lord, have mercy on us. God of all mercy, we pray for the church. As you have saved us by grace through faith, Keep leading us from death to life and into the glory of your eternal realm. In your steadfast love, O Lord, have mercy on us. God of all mercy, we pray for the world. Remember this world that you so loved, and by the life-changing grace of Jesus Christ, deliver it from all destruction. In your steadfast love, O Lord, have mercy on us. God of all mercy, we pray for this community. Comfort those who are afflicted, give food to those who are hungry, and lift up those who are drawing near to death. In your steadfast love, O Lord, have mercy on us. God of all mercy, we pray for loved ones. Send forth your word to help and to heal all who are sick and in distress, so that they may give thanks and praise. In your steadfast love, O Lord, have mercy on us. Restore in us, O God, the joy of your salvation. Renew and sustain our spirits so that we may live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our hope and our strength. Amen. Friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the one triune and living God bless you and keep you until we meet again. Amen. Go in peace, beloved.